will keep that one from a side down. Good right there, ladies and gents. I'm out on Law Vader, more of an organ history. I'm off back down to the historic dockyard of Portsmouth, and this time I'm going to the Submarine Museum. Now the Submarine Museum isn't actually in the historic dockyard of Portsmouth as such, it's across the estuary and it's over in Gospel. Yeah, so it's going to be pretty cool to get myself back down there. One, because the museum is absolutely fantastic, as is the hold of the historic dockyard. But also, it's my old stomping ground. I used to be based down at HMS Collingwood, which is in Fairham. We used to go out on uh, many drunken venture to Gosport. Yeah, so it's going to be quite nostalgic to be that side of the water. It's going to be blinding, really, really looking forward to this. I've only been to the Submarine Museum once before, and that was when I was back in the Navy, and it was when I was doing my submarine escape training. Because the escape training tower, the set is uh, just around the back of the Submarine Museum. That is one of the most awesome, awesome buzzes you can ever do that you can't do anymore. Unfortunately, the health and safety police deemed it too dangerous to learn how to escape from submarines. <laughs> so if ever we're in an emergency situation and you have to escape from a submarine, no one would have actually ever bloody done it. That's crazy. But that's what it is. And I'm no longer a submariner, so it doesn't bother me. And I've also been fortunate enough to have done the proper tower escape a couple of times when I was a submariner. Now I imagine that little black back there just caught me a few flies. And I can't tell on that mirror there. So um, if you're covered in flies, oh no, I'm covered in flies. I'm sorry, can't do anything about it at the moment. Hidden dip. <laughs> that always makes me chuckle. <laughs> Right, I'm going to pull into Lumi's, grab myself a little goffer and give my butt a little bit of a rest from this fantastic custom saddle that is so soft <laughs> and plush on my little dainty behind <laughs> Lumi's, we are in you Well, this is Lumi's. Let's get down to the dockyard. So on the right hand side here, we've got HMS Collingwood, home of the Royal Navy's weapon engineering training. I was there quite a while. I was based there about three years, thereabouts. Doing my uh, foundation degree in electrical electronic engineering. Don't miss it. <laughs> Colling grad, they used to call it. On my right here is uh, Brown Down Training Camp. Used to be an armed forces place, MOD run thingy. But they also filmed Bad Lads Army here, which was a uh, reality TV thing trying to uh, teach lads a little bit of order and discipline in their lives. That had gone a little bit wayward according to their parents. Is also the location of an awesome airsoft site now, South Coast CQB. So Termi, I don't know if you watch my videos, I'm in your neck of the woods, mate. Oh my word, this is just absolutely gorgeous. The sea's just flat calm. Over in the distance on the right there, will that be a different island? That's the Isle of Wight, where Smo tucks his little life away. The Fort Blockhouse, that's where the submarine escape training is down in there. Let's uh, find somewhere to park. So, we're at the Submarine Museum. Cool, I don't know the way in. And I do hope to have a toilet. <laughs> Let's go find everything.
This is a tail. It's a bonkers thing. It's a barrel. It's a blooming barrel with a foot driven propeller where you pedal it <laughs> to turn the propeller, which is a two blade propeller. <laughs> this is crazy. And got a little window so you can stick your head out and have a little look at where you're going. A pump so you can pump water in and out, I'm assuming to affect its buoyancy. Lead weights to hold it down. Um, looks like a set of bellows there. I don't know if you can see them, probably not. But there's a set of bellows over there, which uh, I'm guessing are for air. Crazy thing, absolutely crazy. So, this is a replica of it, it's not a real jobby. Um, and it was the first submarine to ever make an attack. In September 1776, during the American War of Independence, it was used in an attempt to blow up HMS Eagle, the 64 gun flagship of the British fleet in New York Harbour. It's a one man vessel, and it was submerged by admitting water into a small ballast tank on the base of the vessel, so down there, and surfaced by pumping it out with a hand pump, like with those two pumps there. It was propelled using a ped pedal driven propeller, and the turtle's weapon was a keg of powder which was to be attached to an enemy's ship's hull using the drill at the top and detonated by a time fuse. So, there you go, there's a drill, so they go underneath the ship and drill a hole in it. <laughs> That's just insane! A US Army volunteer, Sergeant Urza Lee, was chosen for the job. So it was a volunteer that was chosen. <laughs> The attack was unsuccessful, unsurprisingly unsuccessful. By sheer bad luck, he was unable to screw the drill into the hull. Now, I can't imagine why that would be. Maybe it's because as you tried drilling, the submarine would just bobble around and just wouldn't be able to put any force on it. But mental, absolutely mental. Mad as a box of fox. So this is Holland One, the Royal Navy's first submarine. A lot different to uh, how modern submarines are. We chewed up propeller there. Got a rat cage there so they can tell what the uh, oxygen levels are like, I guess. Now that is basic, isn't it? It's just a tube with an engine. Madness. That would be terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. So this was built up in Barrow and Furness in 1901. And it could travel 20 miles underwater. At a speed of seven knots to a depth of 100 feet. And its, proven, and its purpose was to provide coastal defense. Your planes, propeller, drive shaft, your engine, your engine exhaust. Periscope, with your conning tower, which also had periscopes by the looks of it. Or a, a small periscope, I think. Torpedoes, going into one torpedo tube. The torpedo firing tanks and they push the torpedo out using high pressure water. Madness. Madness. And there's the front torpedo hatch. Can't see much in there, it's dark. But that would have been a big hole of pointy death. It's like a whale, isn't it?
Wow, it's really dark in here, so sorry if you can't see it, I think. So that's where you'd lay your torpedo. And that's the uh, high pressure water tank, which would be used to fire it. Kind of guessing that this wasn't a place you'd want to be very much. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't a uh, periscope, it was a window. <laughs> First submarine launched in 1901. Prior to that, diving trials in 1898. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way because I've come up the ramps the wrong way around. 1885, German engineer produced the first successful four-stroke petrol gasoline engine. So that would have been a game changer for naval warfare. 1881, an Irish-American engineer launched the 19 tons Fenian Ram a steel hull submarine powered by a gasoline engine. Eighteen sixty nine. A bit of science fiction. Eighteen fifty, Michael Faraday produced the first working electric dynamo. So basically the prequel to the motor. 1831, German woodworker built a sheet iron submarine and confronted the Danish fleet blockading Kiel, who panicked and withdrew. <laughs> 1800, Alessandro Volta, Italian physicist, produced the first battery to emit a continuous electric current. So you can see how everything's sort of gradually taking shape, can't you? The American engineer built the turtle. We've seen the turtle over in the older part of the submarine museum. 1620. So this is around the time that Rutland Castle was sacked, where it was put into ruins, I think. I might be getting my dates wrong. So they made a submarine powered by oars. <laughs> What's that? Now that's, that's seriously clever. 333 BC, Alexander the Great made his legendary descent to the ocean floor in a glass barrel. Now, hmm. this is quite a beastie, quite a beastie indeed. So from that you can see, us peoples got quite clever quite quickly regarding electricity, batteries, motors, gas, diesel, petrol powered engines, going from all powered submarines, which are just insane, to diesel powered, electric powered, and now nuclear powered submarines. <laughs> it's absolutely mind blowing. And I'm very proud to have been a submariner. fitting a cannon on a submarine was a good idea. <coughs> they even fitted a hangar onto one and would launch planes from it. I believe the Japanese even actually had what would have been effectively a uh, bomber submarine where they had multiple planes that they were going to be able to launch from their submarine and attack America. But the war ended for them prior to them being able to utilise that. Tex 24 is the only remaining example of a British X-Craft which saw service during World War II. X-24 took part in two operations to penetrate Bergen Harbour, the most heavily defended occupied Norwegian port. The target was the Laksevag floating dock, 
which was highly important because it was used to repair German U-boats. First attack, they uh, hit the wrong ship. Five months later on, on the 11th of September 1944, X-24 again penetrated 30 miles of the mine Ford to enter Bergen Harbour. Now under command of Lieutenant Percy Westbacott, her target was again the floating dock. This attack was codenamed Operation Heckel. Again, X-24 went through the crowded harbour at periscope depth, dodging ferries, tugs and other small craft. The dock was broken in two and sunk together with two small merchant vessels secured alongside it. This would have been a terrifying, terrifying beastie to have served on. It's as crude as they come for submarines. And it would have been proper, proper stinky inside. The diesel engine also ran on batteries as well, I believe. But the batteries wouldn't have lasted very long. So it would have had to have the diesels running as much as possible. There was no room on these submarines for people that didn't know what they were doing. Everyone had a role to do, not just with the mission, but actually in controlling this submarine. It's amazing, it really is. It's a periscope there. Tiny optic on it, but just keep its profile as low as possible. And then you've got snorkels for bringing in air, and letting out diesel fumes and CO2, etc. So we saw the midget class submarine, the X-24, earlier on. But there was also chariots, and they were basically a torpedo with a couple of little seats, a couple of saddles on them for a couple of divers to get pushed into uh, secret missions. They were the, effectively early guided torpedoes, but they were guided by the bloody bugger riding it. Terrifying. Riding a torpedo into battle. <laughs> How epic would that have been? So the various Jolly Roger symbols. That's a gun action, white star, enemy merchant ship, red star, enemy warship, U-boat sunk, enemy warship torpedoed, enemy merchant ship torpedoed, sunk cruiser, mine laying operations, cloak and dagger operation, good old sneaky beakies. Junk sunk. <laughs> I've done that in many a port. <laughs> Beacon or benchmarking operations for amphibious landings. Train or railway track. Railway? Railway track destroyed by gunfire. Submarine went below safe diving depth. Sank a small enemy vessel. Blew up a viaduct. And then German and Japanese prisoners of war taken. Terrifying to learn that one. Okay, so this is the actual more modern part of the submarine museum, showing more modern machinery. Uh, both these submarines are still outdated though. It's Polaris and uh, Swiftshaw. So the Swiftshaw has been taken out of service now, uh, as have the T boats, I believe, completely. And we have the Stu class Hunter Killer submarines, or now attack submarines. The Polaris submarines were replaced by the V-class submarines, the Vanguard-class submarines, and now we're looking again to replace the Vanguard submarines too. In both world wars, submarines made up 3% of the Royal Navy. However, the submarine service had to face exceptional danger, which is reflected by the large number of gallantry medals awarded to submariners. 14 Victoria Crosses have been awarded to the Royal Navy Submarine Service for outstanding courage in action. So this is a depiction showing the various depths that people and things can go down to of various eras. So at the top there you've got a scuba diver, goes to 33 metres. Then below that your World War II submarine, with deep dive depth of 120 metres. The 
modern SSN the deep dive depth of 500 meters and then you've got the Alvin submersible which is 4,300 meters 4.3 kilometers that's just crazy and then I think this last one here the lights gone which is the Trieste which is 11 and a half thousand meters that's just insane so for every nine meters a person descends into the water you go down an atmosphere so I think uh, in comparison the moon is a seventh of our atmosphere so the pressure is reduced seven times um, I think that's correct might be wrong enough whereas going down under the water your pressure increases so for every nine meters you go down the pressure increases by one atmosphere so nine meters is one atmosphere so that doubles the amount of air squashing in your lungs so if you take in a breath of air at nine meters and you held it in your lungs all the way up to the surface you'd potentially explode because you'd have twice as much air in your lungs now if you go even further down 18 meters that's two atmospheres you can see how this is going in this submarine escape training tower they have an example of using an old wine bottle you know those ones for the um, big crates of wine that you get the bags and they just put a breath of air in that and release that from the bottom of the 100 foot 33 meter ascent uh, in the tank that they've got there and as that goes up it expands and expands and expands as that air is, has its pressure released from it and by the time it gets probably <laughs> about nine or ten meters from the, from the surface the bag actually explodes just from one breath and they hold like five liters of wine so five liters of air that's uh, quite mental quite mental indeed i'm going to just show you um the latest generation of submarine escape suits and uh, some uh, fire, firefighting equipment as well so this is the submarine escape immersion suit and you put that on over your clothes, put a uh, line so you can pump it up with your breath. Um, and on this side you've got what's called the stall. And when you're in the uh, LET on your submarine trying to escape, you plug that in and that pushes air into the suit. And once you've got the suit on with the hood fully um, zipped down, this all fills up like a life jacket with air, including the hood and uh, at the bottom of it you've got an air gap here and so once it pressures up that's air trapped in it because it's trying to escape upwards and once you're in the water as the uh, as you get out of the submarine and you rise up to the surface the air expands like we said every nine meters you go up an atmosphere or you lose an atmosphere so that air that's in that suit there will expand and having this gap at the bottom here allows the air to bubble out underneath it. When you're on the surface it's also got air in it still um, and you've got this as well to keep it blown up so then you can uh, survive in this suit quite well until you can get yourself into a life raft. This suit here is a fear not suit, use this for firefighting, it's a woolen suit and uh, it's very good, um, you'd have thought it would be really hot in it, it is but it's not as hot as a fire and it's insulative so uh, yeah it stops you getting a bit too hot when you're fighting fires this here is the submarine escape training tower from above that's a hundred foot down or 33 meters and uh, yeah I've been down at the bottom there floating all the way up to the surface and it's the best best most exciting ride you can ever do it's just fantastic fun it's amazing so this would be interesting to see how similar it is to actual bunk space. <laughs> they were lucky. Um, I can assure you that my bunk space was not that big. The bunks may have been the same width and used the same mattresses, but there's no way you had that same head height. On this bunk here, I'd say you're about there for your bunk head height actually. <laughs> This is a 1970s one, which isn't much different from how it is now. Going to 
how the bunk spaces are today. So on the smaller submarines and on the bigger ones when they've got a full complement including trainees, you do what's called hot bunking. So uh, you're doing six hours on, six hours off. So when uh, one of you gets up, someone else is getting in it. So as you can imagine, they get very stinky and uh, you kind of share any uh, joyful, sweaty sheets and things like that. You do have your own bedding, so uh, you're not going to be sleeping in someone else's bedding. But the mattress is always going to be warm, not pleasant. It's got a ventilation thing there. I hate them. They're just... If you had them off, you got too hot. If you had them on, it just felt like you were being blown up by a, a fan in the face. It's horrible. So behind me we've got HMS Alliance. And then in front of me, as I turn around, which is now behind me, you've got the submarine escape training tower, which is 33 metres deep, full of water, and a brilliant little fairground ride. Unfortunately they don't use that anymore uh, in the same way, so you never get to do a full on ascent from that anymore, which is a real crying shame for future submariners. They're missing out, they really are. The Cold War put a premium on intelligence gathering. Submarines had to be secret and silent. For this reason, in 1960, Alliance was streamlined. In her new configuration, she joined more than a hundred NATO submarines, keeping Soviet Russia and Armageddon at bay. Right, this is the junior rates mess. There will be 25 people living in here, eating, sleeping and drinking. It's laid out in the 50s fashion at this present moment. Um, evening fill, entertainment on this submarine would have been an evening fill if your mess had the projector. Other than that though, it would have been reading, playing cards or playing a game called Uckers. Do you know what Uckers is? No. It's a vicious game of Ludo, basically. And it's played on, played on that board there. It, it does, um, most bunks were shared. They were hot bunked, so there was always two people to a bunk. And it was, pardon? Two people to one of these? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, not the same time. Not the same time, no. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to. One on top of the other. That'd be cosy. <laughs> Next mess beyond as you go down is this, what they call the Stoker's Mess. That's the marine engineers. If you look to the deck in the Stoker's Mess, you'll see a battery compartment. There are two battery <coughs> compartments on board the submarine. These would generate enough electricity to, carry, to keep the submarine submerged travelling at two, two and a half knots for about 36 hours, 40 hours at a real push. Then you had to do one or two things. You either surfaced, open the conning tower hatch up, or you put the snorkel pipe up from 53 feet underneath the water. That's so you could draw air into the submarine, so you could run the engines to replenish the batteries. And this was the only chance as well for changing the air within the submarine as well. The next mess down after that is what they call the senior ace mess, petty officers and chiefs. There's a wreath land in the middle of the table there, and that's because the sister submarine of this boat, the Afray, she was off the Channel Islands in 1951, or she was snorkeling, and they think her snorkel pipe snapped, fractured, and that allowed three tonnes per second of salt water to basically enter the engine room, it's a 20 inch pipe, and flooded the engine room, she went down with all hands on board, and this was the boat that laid the wreath over her grave when they eventually found it. And then the last mess along here is what they call the ERA's mess, which is the engine room artificers. They were the old fogies on board the submarine, as far as I was concerned, as a youngster anyway. We then walked through the next water-type bulkhead door. You'll come to the wardroom on the right-hand side, where the officers and the captain lived. Um, and if you look up right in there, there's a tower. It's the old gun tower. And that's where the ammunition used to be passed through for the gun that was on the casing. And it's the only place on the submarine where a diver can leave and re-enter the boat, whilst the submarine's underwater. We'll then be in the control room. Look quite comfy there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. On the boat, on the boat in 
between Denmark and Norway. We have a Finish on that one, come round here. Come round here. Uh, if you were steering the submarine, you'd be in that seat in the corner over there. If you're operating the four planes, you'd be in this seat here, and the after planes in this seat here. The four planes and after planes are the wings on the submarine that make you alter the depth when you're under when you're submerged. This submarine could go down to 500 feet. When they built this class of boat, they built two extra holes and they crushed <coughs> depth tested one of them and it was heard to implode at 997 feet. So 500 feet is quite a safe depth. Now, of a night time in the Navy, we always go to red lighting. The reason why we go to red lighting is so that your eyes get accustomed to darkness. A couple of other things is that if we had a periscope up, um, <coughs> at night, if I just put my hand there, see, See the white light in my hand? Well, that's the white light coming out from outside in. Now, if we had a white, if it's dark out there, if we had a white light in here, that'd be a white light shining out yeah. through the periscope. So that would give us a way. Also gets your eyes accustomed to darkness as well. I'll turn the light back on. Is that the kitchen? Yeah. Oh, my God. That is amazing. Yeah. What a bloody awesome visit that was! That really is a really interesting museum to go and visit. And I used to see the escape training tower so close as well. Old memories, eh? Awesome stuff. Well that was an absolutely blinded visit. I'm so glad I got down there today and I'm so glad we've got this gorgeous, gorgeous weather to get out on the bike and play. I really highly recommend that you get yourself an annual pass down to the, uh, the historic dockyard at Portsmouth. There's so much to do down there. Definitely way more than one visit's worth. I'm going to be doing it in around 10 visits, I believe, or thereabouts. So absolutely good value for money. I hope you enjoyed my second visit down to the historic dockyard at Portsmouth. The Submarine Museum is a standalone, awesome, awesome place to go and view as are all the other attractions there but yeah, I mean it's just a fantastic place to go visit so go and have a look if you found this interesting and again if you did find this interesting don't forget to hit that subscribe button I'll put plenty of other stuff up like this I don't just visit submarines I visit old ships went to the HMS Victory on my last visit down to the dockyard I also visit castles got my English Heritage Motor Vlog series and I also have a kind of sub-series which isn't English heritage but it is still castles just because they don't all come under the same roof of the English heritage as that's a standalone charity I just got back from a trip to Wales now I don't know whether those videos or any of those videos have gone up yet but there was a trip to Wales and a trip to two castles when I was over in Wales so I'm all over the place and you're bound if you like this to find some of them pretty good too I'm not professing to know much about history far from it I don't even know much about anything but I do love getting on my motorbike and going exploring and on a day like this who can blame me eh? so if you did like this video give it a little thumbs up we like them 
if you didn't like it you can give it a thumbs down that doesn't matter it's all good but whatever you do please give me some feedback let me know what it was you liked and let me know what it was that you didn't or not tell me about a visit that you had to one of these places or maybe a place that you suggest I go and have a look at my ears are open and I'm happy to have suggestions for the places I could try and venture to in the future I'm not necessarily going to be able to get to all of them but I will try as always you ride safe take care and I'll catch you all in the next one bye for now keep that bar from Hey yeah, you know, you gotta keep that bar. Rubber sound down.